Welcome in one of my favorite guests, ESPN play-by-play broadcaster Adam Amin. No Thursday night college football last night because it was reserved for the NFL and the season opener, which we're going to jump right in with in a moment. But Adam will be on the call for USC and Stanford tomorrow night uh, at the Coliseum in Los Angeles. Good morning, Adam. Good morning, my friend. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, I was, I'm was. i anxious to talk to you because you did the Bears uh, preseason games, and uh, <laughs> I got to watch as much as I could. Uh, certainly a little bit of a snooze fest. Um, did you see this coming? I mean, uh, Mitchell Trubisky had a terrific year last year, I thought, for the Bears. Both defenses played great. I'm sure if you're the Bears defense, you're thinking, man, what else do we have to do? And I guess the answer would be shut them out, not give up 10. But Packers 10, Bears 3. And, and I know at times the Bears uh, – Move the football, Trubinsky threw for 208 yards, but that doesn't tell the story. They just they just couldn't make any plays, particularly uh, there at the end of the game when you're you're down there around the 10 yard line with a chance to tie that thing up, and on third down the corner route, I don't know what he was looking at as an NFL quarterback. You could see it coming that that ball was going to be intercepted. So I'm going around the world here, Adam, but uh, the Bears a very disappointing performance in their home opener against a hated rival that now kind of puts them behind the eight ball early this season. Yeah, and, and obviously it's not a lost year or anything like that, even though if you listen to uh, I, one of my favorite pastimes is after a Bears loss, flipping on sports radio in Chicago, <laughs> either you know the following day or, or the next Monday to see what the what people are screaming about. And sure enough, they're screaming about Mitch Trubisky, and they're screaming about, the, in particular, the play calling uh, for Matt Nagy. And there are a lot of questionable play calls, at least in the eyes of fans, and, and certainly, uh, I would say, uh, football analysts, I think a lot of them would say, what are you doing trying to run a shovel pass on third and one to Cordero Patterson? Something that, by the way, was not practiced in a game situation during the preseason. And that, that's the other point of contention right now mm-hmm. in Chicago is, is the direct correlation, whether there is one or there isn't one. But certainly fans are going to make that connection and people, football people in general, who may not be in that Bears locker room are going to make that connection. Well, you didn't play in the preseason. You didn't play any of your starters. You didn't get the, get an idea uh, of any type of rhythm and, and mechanics uh, in preparation for the season, which I do agree with. That is something you lose because Matt Nagy talked about it. Matt told me that one of the biggest concerns he always has in, in, in getting ready is the mechanics. Is All right, what's the communication going to be like from the booth upstairs to me, to Mitch, to... You know, like just what's the sequence of events? What's the sequence of communication like? And there were two delay of game penalties on the offense yesterday. This is supposed to be this clicking, well-oiled machine of an offense that everybody has high expectations for, and rightfully so, yet they can't really execute something as basic as play call to coach to QB to huddle to snap and and when you have that many issues people are going to criticize your decisions to not play your starters more than three snaps together in the preseason and there's only so much joint practicing and there's only so much scrimmaging you can do before some of these things do rear their ugly head is it a lost cause of course not they lost this game last year and came back to win 12 games that's not to say that they can't do that again i personally had them at 10 wins Mm -hmm. because i thought the division was better than, they, than it was a year ago. It's healthier. Aaron Rodgers is healthy, even though he didn't have a great performance by any means, and nor did the Green Bay offense. But he he's healthy. This is a better division and one of the more competitive divisions in the NFL. So I'm not like I'm not throwing the season away based on this one loss. But I'm tell, I feel like, and I know a lot of people in Chicago this morning feel like that's a loss that could have been prevented had this offense gotten a little bit more comfort during the preseason. And it's not just a preseason thing. Obviously, execution was awful. Mitch Trubisky threw terrible passes last night. He threw one interception. Just to wrap that thought up, just, this is, this is the, the thinking is now, well, you didn't do anything in the preseason. You didn't play your starters. You didn't give them any reps. And now this is what you get. This is your punishment. Yeah. This is your, pen, uh, your, you know, your penance. You have to suffer through a loss to a division rival. The season's not over by any means. This is a game they lost last year and came back and won 12. But the, there's going to have to be significant significant improvement if this is going to be an uh, an offense that's going to be able to carry the load on on nights where the defense is going up against a really strong offensive team the defense was great we know the defense is great mm-hmm. they have maybe the most talent of any team in the NFL uh, on the defensive side but 
they can't do it every single game. They can't do it every single night. Indeed, and that is the disappointment. You hold Rodgers to 203 with just one touchdown and hold him to 47 yards rushing, and you get beat. Let's stay with the NFL. Two of the biggest names uh, at wide receiver in the league having issues. Let's start with Julio Jones. I, I ran some audio from him in uh, the earlier segment after practice yesterday, and it was the first time, Adam, that I sensed in his voice a little bit of frustration. And he, he kind of tiptoed around whether or not he would play if he doesn't have a new deal in place. He said he planned to play. Play. He said the team, you know, was was planning for him to play, but he never 100 percent came out and said, I'm playing regardless. I had D. Orlando Ledbetter on from the AJC yesterday. He said he thought a deal could get done today if it doesn't get done in the next couple of days. Do you think Julio will play in Minnesota on Sunday? I think I mean, I think he's willing to hold out. Uh, I, I understand the holdout process now, too, especially after what happened with Ezekiel Elliott. I mean, it's not like Ezekiel Elliott had a ton of leverage, you know, and I know Jerry Jones. Would, would tell you that, oh, well, well we need Ezekiel Elliott, and I know a lot of Cowboys fans will tell you that. He didn't have a whole lot of leverage financially. I mean, he was in, in terms of uh, the actual money that he was paid, he was probably going to get paid that somewhere. I think the leverage came in wanting to play in Dallas, mm-hmm. and those guys wanted to get a deal done. Both parties were all in on trying to get a deal done, and if that's not the case in Atlanta, I could see him not playing in the opening game. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on this too, Gary. It's, it's very interesting that he is, I mean, he, he, he's showing some of the frustrations. He said that he'll still play. Like he wants to play in the opener, even if the contract doesn't get done. I could see a scenario where he doesn't, where he's advised not to. I'd like to believe that he will regardless, but I, it, it's interesting to see somebody like Julio who kind of sat through some lean years and, and we started to hear some of the frustrations last year. You, you remember this, when he wasn't getting red zone targets and he wasn't mm-hmm. just being targeted in general. And you started to hear Julio start to start to discuss those things publicly. Uh, I feel like it, it maybe comes to it. I think he plays. I could see a scenario where he doesn't, but I just personally think he plays. He said he wanted to. Uh, I think he'll be in uniform regardless, but this is a guy that needs to have a deal done. Part of the, the talent level of Atlanta a good chunk of their offensive talent comes from arguably having a, a top five wide receiver core uh, with, with Julio and Sanu and, and, a, and a cast that has filled in really nicely the last two years. Uh, I feel like he'll play, but I, I can understand where the frustrations are starting to come in. And this is a deal that needs to get done because he still is one of the cornerstones of what Atlanta has been doing offensively the last four or five years. Now to Antonio Brown, and I remember we discussed him at length and whether or not he would make it in Oakland. Uh, John Gruden wanted wanted him, wanted to give him a shot. But let's just be honest, uh, Adam, it's been a train wreck so far from the helmet to now this altercation with Mike Mayock. Uh, no thought that he's going to play Monday night against the Broncos. And I would ask you, and I will, uh, do you think his career with the Raiders is over? Before it starts. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when when's it going to start exactly? <laughs> that might be that might be an interesting question too. I'm I'm not sure that his Raiders career is over, but I, I see a lot of uh, a lot of groundswell to just say let's cut him loose and void out the thirty million dollar guarantee by spending him if he's not on the active roster for opening day. There's an opportunity to get that money back and to void the thirty million dollar guarantee. I think Antonio Brown is is is. I mean, we've discussed it. He thinks he doesn't need football, and I tend to agree with him. I don't think he needs to play football to have a a comfortable, enjoyable life. But if he does want to keep playing football, which I would imagine he does in some capacity, he wants to play it under his rules, but he may not get $30 million somewhere else to do it. He may not be able to live the type of lifestyle he wants, and he may not – this may not appeal to him playing in Oakland. It clearly doesn't appeal to a lot of the guys that are there right now. Mike Mayock's frustration levels have to be skyrocketing at this point to have to deal with all of the impending drama that comes with this. How do you think people in Pittsburgh are feeling right now? They're like, yeah, this is what, this is what you get. This is, a, this is what you should have expected. And this is the punishment that you have for going out and signing a guy like this. And this is why we didn't want him. I, I, don't, I think he plays, again, I just don't see a scenario where he doesn't play all year. But I can understand the frustrations and wanting to say, you know what, we could recoup that money, get it to somewhere else, pay somebody else, pay somebody else a fraction of the value that Antonio Brown is demanding. 
And if that ends up being the case, I, I mean, Oakland was going to was gonna have some issues, but they have some talent on that team outside of Antonio Brown. They've got a returning quarterback. They've got an improved offensive line. I think Josh Jacobs is going to be really important this year, uh, which I thought was a great pick for Oakland in the first round this season. That was the pick that, that they got from the Bears for the, in the Khalil Mack trade. Uh, I, I think Josh Jacobs is going to be crucial. So I think they can get by without him. I don't think they necessarily need to have Antonio Brown to have a successful year. But obviously that's a, a level of talent that you're missing out on. I, I, I wouldn't want to deal with it. If I'm in Mike Mayock's shoes, I say, let's recoup. Uh, let's cut our losses and let's deal with this without Antonio Brown. Yep, indeed. All right, let's talk college football. Uh, two matchups tomorrow that uh, take the spotlight involve SEC teams going on the road uh, to Power 5 conference opponents in Texas A&M's case. They go to number one ranked Clemson. Last year in uh, College Station, A&M could have won the game. Of course, if you talk to their fans, they'll tell you they should have won the game. Uh, but now they're on the road. Uh, Jimbo Fisher, I think, feels like he's got a good football team. I don't know if they've got enough firepower to go into to Clemson and, and pull the upset. Do you think they can get this game into the fourth quarter the way they did last year when they were at home? I, I don't. I, I personally don't. And and that's just that's not, nothing against their defense because I think they've got a strong defense. I, I don't know if they can establish the run against that Clemson front. And that, that's my biggest concern because to win on the road, you have to run the football. And I don't know Texas A&M is going to be able to do it consistently against Clemson. That, that's a major concern for me uh, going into that game. I, I think the environment is going to be a factor. Not to say that it's going to be too big for Texas A&M. I just think Clemson plays so well at home, their comfort level at home. And I know they had some interesting and rocky games the last three seasons at home against opponents that a lot of people said, well, they should clearly clearly steamroll these opponents. They didn't have Trevor Lawrence in a lot of those games. Uh, remember the game last year where he got hurt at home? They struggled, but he wasn't playing most of that game. Uh, the year, you know, Years before where they dropped games to Pittsburgh or NC State, Trevor Lawrence wasn't the quarterback. This is a different animal that Clemson is right now in my estimation. And I know he had a couple picks against Georgia Tech. That's fine. Game one. I, I expect good things from Trevor Lawrence all season long, and I just don't know if, like you said, Gary, I don't know if Texas A&M has the firepower to keep it a fourth-quarter game. Can, can they keep it close for a half? I, I've always believed that your one can, can battle with just about anybody if you're at a school like Texas A&M, if you're at a top-15 program. Your ones are as good as anybody's in the country. They could be playing for the other team. But the, the level of depth concerns me. The lack of running game in comparison to where they were a year ago with Travion Williams concerns me, and I think Clemson is 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 primed at home to kind of put together something that, that might be pretty special. LSU goes to Austin, and uh, this is a game with big recruiting implications. LSU recruits in Texas. Texas recruits in Louisiana. Uh, Texas is coming off the big Sugar Bowl win over Georgia, so the SEC Big 12 dynamics at work. And uh, I like LSU here. I'll just go ahead and, and say it. I, I think they're a better football team. With what they've done offensively, I am beginning to believe that this is a different LSU team. I think we'll find out in, in Austin what you're, uh, what you're feeling on how this game will play out. Uh, and, and doesn't it come down to how much faith do you have in Joe Burrow? It does. I, I think everywhere else, I, and we've said this for years, Gary, and you've seen it up close when Alabama and LSU play. LSU has all-world caliber talent at every position except for one and it's always been the one spot <laughs> that that concerns every LSU fan every time they have a big game is can our quarterback make plays and I think this year a second year in this offense we saw what Joe Burrow did in the opener granted against an inferior opponent I uh, I think the I think that's enough I think you can go into Austin I think this is a prove it game for LSU a lot of you know you and I kind of said are they ranked uh, properly in the preseason? Are they overranked? Are they underrated? What are they? And, and I, th- I was a little surprised. I thought, okay, well, even despite coming off the great great season last year and the Peach Bowl win and all that, I'm like, all right, let's see what LSU's really made of. And, and obviously, Texas brought back a lot. You know, they've got a secondary that is, a t- I would say, one of the 10 best secondaries in the country, and that's not easy to say for a Big 12 defense, but they have a supremely talented secondary uh, they've lost a lot in the front seven. You know, I remember seeing them last year and just thinking, well, man, they're going to have to replace a whole lot. I think LSU has the ability to run the ball. I think the intermediate passing game is going to be important for them, uh, trying to find matchups with slot guys and tight ends against linebackers. I think they have an opportunity to exploit certain things in the Texas defense. And if they can run the football, again, on the road, can you run it and establish possession and keep that Texas offense with Sam Ellinger and their talented receivers off the field? 
I think you got a real shot to win this game. And I think they're a less, less than a touchdown favorite or so. I, I think they have an opportunity to not only win, but I think if they can run the football, they might be able to cover tomorrow night too. I, I think this is a really big opportunity for LSU to prove it. And if they win this game tomorrow, can you imagine what it's going to be like uh, in the next two months in the lead-up to LSU-Alabama? Because people are going to be hyping up this LSU team like nobody else if they can go into, into, into Austin and win a game like that. Indeed. All right, let's do a little rewind because Alabama's got New Mexico State tomorrow afternoon, so we know the, the outcome of that one. What did you think of uh, the Tide uh, 42-Duke 3? What were your takeaways when you went back and reviewed that game? Uh, no, I mean, nothing too shocking, right? Tua Tunga Bailoa, uh, typical. Uh, this is what we wanted to see. This is what we expect against, uh, again, no offense to Duke, but, but uh, against the defense that he's clearly superior then uh, in terms of talent level. Uh, I, I like the idea of, of finding Jerry Judy as much as humanly possible. I like the fact that he was a main target. Uh, I like the fact that they were able to do it in the running game without having their full complement of backs for a portion of the game. I, I, I think that's important. Uh, all the Nick Saban tools that we want to see, uh, he's got a strong quarterback, he's got uh, a, a well-balanced offense, and we know what the talent level on defense is, even with the injuries. So I was thoroughly impressed, uh, but it's kind of what we expected, right? I didn't, I didn't think it was going to be uh, a performance that shocked anybody. We'd all kind of look at the score afterwards and say, all right, all right that's about what we expected. So uh, I, I'm not expecting much different, obviously, tomorrow uh, against New Mexico State. I'll be interested to see what they look like against South Carolina. That's a, that's a South Carolina team that, listen, I'm, I'm as thrilled as anybody that Mac Brown got that win. Uh, I have Mac and uh, North Carolina next Friday night, uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing him and, and seeing what his team is looking like. I'm, I'm intrigued by that North Carolina-Miami matchup, but I, I think South Carolina is kicking itself right now, and I know they have a new quarterback going in. Ryan Holinsky is going to start uh, this week and likely next week against Alabama, so I, I'm interested to see how that's going to play out, but this is an Alabama team that, I mean, I'm looking at their schedule right now, Gary. I, I think they're better than Texas A&M. I know they're going to have to go into a really tough environment in, uh, in mid-October, but you, you find me a, a guaranteed loss. You know, I, and you never really can with, with an Alabama mm-hmm. schedule, but you find me a night where they're really going to struggle up until you know, the, the second week of November when LSU comes into town. I don't see it, and, and I'm, I'm kind of just waiting to see what, what it's going to look like, how many more points they're going to score. Uh, how strong they are defensively against some of these SEC teams that left a lot to be desired in week one. All right. Uh, I know I have listened to everybody tell me how bad the Houston defense is. I get it. Um, but still, I mean, there's no denying that that Jalen Hurts, uh, that was a history-making debut. Oh. I mean, to have over 500 yards of total offense, over 150 yards rushing, 300 yards passing, three rushing touchdowns, three passing touchdowns. I mean, join Johnny Manziel. That's elite company yeah. for quarterbacks that have done that. So regardless of the opponent, I mean – it couldn't have gone any better for Jalen Hurts, could it? And then after the game, I think he, he impressed people with how disappointed he was in the team's performance in the post-game interview with uh, Holly Rowe. How scary is that? If that if he put that type of performance together against a, a group of, a strong group of five team, by the way, Houston's a good team. Like they, They've got a talented quarterback. We know what the defensive problems are, obviously, but that's, that's not all that uncommon with, with – uh, uh, American conference teams, high level offense, maybe lower level defense, but man, if that's how he feels after that performance, how scary is that going to be? The level of focus that you see from Jalen Hurts uh, in that post game interview, the the way he's react, the way he's won over his teammates, mm-hmm. even going back to the to the to the summertime when he's doing the you know the squats in the weight room and and earning the respect and trust of everybody in that locker room. Uh, how, how how do you not want to run through a brick wall for the guy and? You know, again, is it anything that surprising, Gary? We've known Jalen for three years now as a class, quality, high character individual with a lot of talent that maybe didn't fit perfectly uh, to what Nick Saban wanted to do, or perhaps uh, wasn't optimized in a way that satisfied a ton of Alabama fans every single week. But I think every Alabama fan knows what he was capable of. I think every Alabama fan knows that he is exceptionally talented and a clearly wonderful person that was raised right and and has garnered the attention and leadership ability from his teammates. I think that's phenomenal, and I'm scared of Oklahoma's offense. I'm telling you. I, I think any question we had about it, not, I don't think there were a ton of questions about it, 
But any issues that anybody may have had, those dissipated very quickly with what we saw Sunday night. All right, Adam, this is always the case when we talk. Josh is going crazy in the control room. But I, I, the or, Auburn-Oregon game, I think, proved what we what we thought we knew. And, and you know, for most of that game, Bo Nix looked like a freshman. But he's got the clutch gene. And we saw it on yeah. that final drive. I mean, he is exactly who we thought that he is. He is going to be a really tough, hard-nosed quarterback for Auburn. And that was a heck of a comeback. Huge win for Gus Malzahn. Yeah, and, and listen, I, I, I'm perfectly – fine with saying, hey, I didn't expect that much about Bo Nix. We talked about it last week. I didn't think it was going to be something like that. And he looked like what we thought he was going to look like out of the gate against a good Oregon defense and a tough environment. That was a brutal first half to watch. What does he do in in, in clutch time? What does he do when it matters the most? Thoroughly impressed. I know the whole college football world was thoroughly impressed. You know, Jordan Palmer is one of the guys that he's known for a long time. And Jordan has talked very highly about Bo and the type of individual he is and the type of demeanor he has in game situations I didn't know it would translate that quickly into a clutch situation but good for Bo Nix and good for Auburn good to see we know what type of defense they have we know the front we know that there's a lot of talent NFL talent on that side of the ball it's good to see that in the biggest moments the offense can step up I'll be interested to watch them against Tulane and see how comfortable Bo feels when he gets a home game under his belt all right Adam I got a get you to do this in less than a minute but your game tomorrow night Stanford and USC at the Coliseum hey that one over Fresno State I don't think that did much to to quiet uh, Clay Helton's critics I mean the 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 fourth down attempt there at the end the game was completely botched fortunately they get an interception in the end zone to to win the game but this is a huge game for USC at home against Stanford tomorrow night and for his coaching future would you agree Absolutely. Every game that Clay Helton coaches right now is huge for his coaching future. And now he's got to do it with a, with a true freshman right. quarterback. You know, J.C. Daniels is done for the season. In comes Keaton Slovis, a three-star quarterback. I'll give you guys a great nugget to walk away with. Thirteen quarterbacks will have started in this century for USC. Keaton Slovis will be the first three-star quarterback. That's crazy. Everybody else that has started a QB this century for USC was a four- or five-star QB coming out of high school, and Keaton Slovis, who beat out two other veterans for the backup job and now gets thrust into this role. Everybody talks about how, how his demeanor is. We'll find out because this is a rivalry game. Granted, it's at home, but a Pac-12 game, rivalry game. And by the way, K.J. Costello likely, or, or is out. It was already announced. So it's a battle of the backups in a crucial early season game for both of these teams. Stanford for Pac-12 contention, and frankly for USC to try to keep Clay Helton's job. All right, Adam, great stuff. Follow him on Twitter, at Adam Amin. Catch him uh, on Thursday night college football normally, Saturday night uh, this week with Stanford at USC, and, and with me most Fridays here on the Gary Harris Show. Thanks so much, my friend. Thanks, buddy.